Hello, I'm Matej Moncas from the University of Mons in Belgium and uh, I will do a speech on visual attention. Uh, I will do this speech because uh, visual attention be began in 1998, more or less, with a paper from uh, Laurent Itty. And it was a quite linear and easy to understand research field during 15 years. Uh, however, it recently became much more complex. Uh, my purpose here is to try to, to make a picture of um, all the domains where visual attention today uh, is involved in. Right, so first, what is visual attention? Uh, visual attention is a kind of filter uh, which will make you select in an image like that one the regions which are more interesting for you for which are more informative for you for example the sky here is not so interesting you will take a look maybe but that's all uh, while the lighthouse and the houses around are much more interesting to to look and you, you see people stuff so etc so you will really focus much more on some parts of the image and not on the others. That's the purpose of visual attention. So visual attention can be analyzed uh, by using an eye tracker. So for example, here you have two cameras looking to the, the guy and the eye direction is then computed and you get a kind of heat map like that where hot colors will represent regions which were attended by the viewers and um, cold colors like blue uh, represent regions which are not attended by people so you see that the sky uh, of course is not very interesting while uh, the lighthouse here and the houses around as we have predicted are much more interesting well in addition to um, analyze people uh, eye direction what you can do is to make models which uh, will predict automatically predict actually where people will look so what we can see here is called a saliency map a saliency map is a map with pixels which will tell you here that there is a high probability for the average uh, viewer to look in here while those pixels will tell you that the probability to look here is very low, right? Because the information here is not very important, while here it is much more interesting. But why working on visual attention apart from science? Well, for application, of course. Uh, you have here an example of uh, video surveillance where suspicious areas here, like a guy pointing a gun on another guy, are detected because they are very different from what usually happens at that place, like walking in different directions, etc. So when you find something unusual, surprising, uh, this should attract your attention. And in uh, video surveillance, this is very important. Or you can work on defect detection and defects are actually interesting because they are different from uh, normality. You can also use visual attention in computer graphics where there are regions that should be probably rendered in a, with a higher quality than others. The most interesting regions should be better rendered than the others. It's also possible to work on uh, automatic retargeting or automatic zooming we're zooming on the interesting regions like here or here or here is very very interesting you have robotics also where the robotic eyes that you can see here should be able to point the meaningful targets uh, which might be interesting into for example changing or adapting uh, the robot behavior and finally, in marketing, you can uh, have heat maps of um, uh, the regions which attract people's uh, attention. And if you have that, you can more or less in real time try to optimize your uh, marketing 
communication. Well, let's go now into some details uh, of attention. So as you can see here, attention is a competition actually between two components, one which is called bottom-up or exogenous and the other one which is called top-down or endogenous. So bottom-up uh, part will take the signal coming from the outside world, okay, so images for us, images or, or video, and will extract low-level features, okay, low-level features um, which basically are uh, different from um, normality, contrasted, surprising, and non-predictable, uh, not easy to compress, etc. And for those features, there is no need of memory or, or learning. Okay. On the other side, you have top-down and endogenous attention here, where actually memory is very, uh, very well involved. Okay, so memory, for example, is very important. Uh, for example, I, I found an object that I already know, and so I, I, I make attention on that. Um, emotions are very important. If something makes me happy or unhappy, then I will, uh, I will make fixation on it. And volition, of course, uh, if I have a task to do, uh, like searching for keys or whatever, I will modify the way uh, I'm attending to my uh, to, to my environment. Great. So now that we know what visual attention is, let's get into uh, modelization. So th this is the first model, the one from Laurent Itty in the 1998. Uh, so basically. This is a pipeline that all the models used maybe during 15 years. You have a first part where you have feature extraction. So for example, color features, intensity features, orientations, uh, at different scales, as you can see. Uh, then you have uh, a second step, which is uh, the magic, let's say the magic step, where you will um, compute the contrast or the rarity or the surprise that these features are uh, doing on people and for example for uh, Laurent ET it's a center surround difference so it's a it's a, like a local contrast okay and once you have those feature maps you combine them into conspicuity maps Okay, you have one conspicuity map for colors, intensity, and orientation. And finally, you combine them uh, together with a fusion system uh, into a final saliency map. All right, so on the right side, you can see what happens. You have the initial image here, three conspicuity maps for colors, intensity, uh, and orientations. And then they are fused together into the final saliency map, which will summarize all the interesting areas of uh, the initial image. Right, so as I said, the, the beginning of visual attention is really very simple, very linear, at least uh, from 1998 to almost 2014 and 15 here. Um, we have only bottom-up visual models um, okay so it's really really mainly bottom-up uh, very few top-down information right? as i say here very few top-down information everything is explainable uh, which means that if you have your final result and you can go back into uh, the algorithm and find why this result is uh, good or, or not uh, the results that we have on the datasets, especially the MIT saliency dataset, are poor for the first models to medium for the, the last models. So, of course, you have models going better and better, but still uh, being medium at the end. And, yeah, they, they use low-level features. Uh, I put here some references uh here but of course there are much more models than that 
Of course, things changed a lot with the arrival of uh, deep learning. And here is a classical um, architecture that you can find for uh, visual attention. You have an encoder, which can be, for example, a VGG or whatever other, other architecture. And then you have a decoder uh, on the other side, okay, which will be a <laughs> deconvolution, right, uh, at different levels if you want. And at the end, you will have the saliency map, which will be compared with the ground truth. The ground truth is, of course, um, real eye tracking from, from real people. And the idea here is that you learn what in an image will uh, attract uh, people attention on the ground truth. However, what you can see here is that we use learning, um, which is very good actually when you have a lot of data. Uh, you have this example here, you have a lot of um, white uh, artifacts here, which can be learned, for example, with deep learning, but there is only one like that. Up. And that one is actually surprising and uh, attracting, actually. Right, so a question is how you can just by learning uh, be able to find those surprising areas. And the answer is not easy because, uh, as we'll see, most of the deep learning based models will learn here, especially top down information like uh, faces attract attention, usually text attracts attention, people attract attention, but very few like uh, weird features will attract attention. Right, so from 2015, let's say, uh, here, you have a new branch coming on the tree of visual attention uh, based on DNN. Uh, they will really focus on top-down information, while here they will all focused on bottom-up information. They are not easy to explain because, of course, you have a DNN and it's not easy to go back to see what happens inside. Uh, however, the results are not bad. They are actually very good uh, because most of the data sets, like, like uh, MIT saliency benchmark here, uh, they all have images where uh, most of the information is top down, actually. So here you can see on this benchmark that, I mean, for a given metric, but that's more or less true for the other metrics. You see that all the first the first models are all DNN based. Okay, so finally, what we see is that if you have a good top down model, uh, then it will be a good model uh, overall. But then, when people understood that bottom up attention was really not taken a lot into account into DNN models, they said, let's let's go back a little bit to to features. And let's use deep features because models, deep learning models are really very, very good in extracting deep features. So let's take, like, for example, here, a simple VGG trained on ImageNet, uh, which has several uh, layers. And on each layer, we can compute a kind of magic that we computed before, like the rarity here. And if we do that, we obtain for an input image, a final saliency map, which will take into account both some top-down information from higher level uh, layers here, and bottom-up information from lower level uh, here. So by doing that, there is a new branch in our tree here, which is quite recent with deep feet or a deep rare uh, models here. Uh, which will take into account both bottom-up and top-down, even if the bottom part, let's say, is higher than top-down part. Uh, they are more explainable than the others because you can access to the feature maps. 
And the good thing is they have good results on all data sets. So let's test specific data sets. Here you have the MIT data set with a lot of top down information. You see the ground truth, uh, so the real eye tracking from real people. And you see the model proposed here uh, with results which make sense, actually, which are quite close to the ground truth. But you have here another. Uh, another data set which is purely bottom up, okay, with just like big uh, circles into small circles or different color, etc. So you have the ground truth here, 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 and here, and you have the same model which finds the targets here, 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 and here. Okay, while uh, deep deep learning models here are completely lost and they just do weird stuff, okay, well, like here. So those models here are able to handle both top-down uh, information data sets, so they are, they are better than the models previously that we previously made here, uh, but they're still good on bottom-up um, on bottom-up data sets here, where uh, deep learning models are very bad. Well, in the same time that uh, deep learning models came into visual attention, um, some visual attention modules uh, came actually inside the deep learning, inside the NLs. And this began also in 2015, uh, by an application which is actually a translation application, so it's not computer vision, it's about translation. Uh, so what happens here is that there is an encoder, okay, which is um, a recursive uh, neural network which goes in several directions. Uh, okay, so this encoder normally sends his its last state to the decoder here, which will uh, try to guess the word, uh, which is the best here. Uh, the problem is with the last uh, state of the encoder will not uh, give different weights to different different words. Um, well, of course, when you uh, when you say I want to eat a great cheese. Uh, if I'm on the word eat, uh, the important word I need to focus on is cheese because what I'm uh, I'm eating. Okay, so we should be able to provide different weights, like here, different weights uh, for different states, uh, right? And this is. This layer is called uh, an attention layer, which is actually um, just an additive attention here, uh, which was introduced into the, the structure, the deep learning structure. And this really brought a lot of uh, information and improvements in, for, um, for translation, at least. Well, so translation is good. But uh, what about computer vision, actually? Well, in computer vision, uh, a quite close um, idea with the previous one is used for image captioning, for example. So here you have an image, right? And it is described by a sentence, which is here, a bird flying over a body of water. So this is automatically it is an automatic description uh, which is based on the fact that the system is able to focus on a specific region of the image. So, for example, for a, it was looking here, for bird here, for flying here, over here, etc. Or you have uh, the other saliency maps on top. So, for bird, of course, you look to the bird. For over, you look to the bird, but you look under the bird because you want to know over what. Right, so uh, you have this soft attention here, which will give a weight between 0 and 1 for each pixel in the image. 
right from low weights here to high weights here and this part is called hard attention because you actually give one uh, weight of one in a small region and zero to all the rest of the image so you discard all the rest of the features so attention here is used to um, sequentially analyze an image and to choose this second actually and you can see other results here so for example a woman throwing a frisbee in a park free if you check frisbee that's the saliency map of the frisbee so you check the frisbee a dog is standing uh, on a floor the dog is here a stop sign is doing something okay it's here uh, a giraffe standing in a forest with trees so trees is all but the giraffe a group of people you see the people in here and a little girl so the girl is in here so you can see that this idea of looking not to all the image but to parts of the image which might be of interest in a, in a sequential way is the key for having a good image captioning system. So all this new work uh, led to a new uh, branch in our tree about image-based uh, image captioning, actually DNN-based image captioning. I changed the color because people who work in this community are actually quite different from people working in that community here. They don't really know or exchange between them and this uh, this is probably a bad thing. Um, so the idea of attention within uh, DNNs is that we should focus the network on a reduced set of features at, at the time to be more efficient. Okay, and so it comes from language processing, uh, and of course, image captioning is both both language processing and uh, image processing. So they they are good together. But if we take the idea of attention, which is focusing on a different area of the image at a time which is also the case here in this module you can it means that you can focus on several objects one by one so it's also interesting for multiple object detection uh, and th synthesis so there are like some papers in in that direction so here for example you have this system which is able to read actually the house number it focuses first on the four and then it moves four five then it focuses on five the other state on the six etc so you are able to read uh, those multiple figures which follows one to the others and you can read them and at some point you can synthesize them uh, as we can see in this other paper where uh, the authors are synthesizing uh, figures so for example you see in time how the focus the attention focus evolves during uh, drawing uh, drawing figures okay so for example if i want to draw a zero i will begin here and turn and turn and turn etc until i finish my zero uh, so the initial states are quite the same but then depending on where they focus on like here, 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 etc. Then you will get an eight. Uh, here you'll have a three, etc. And you can do it, of course, with several figures in colors, not only on simple data sets like like MNIST here. You can use more complex data sets, and uh, yeah. And then interestingly, you begin by writing, I mean, from the right to the left, as you can see here. And you can do this, of course, with something else than figures. It all depends uh, on the data sets that you, you learn, of course. So here is another branch to our attention tree uh, with, uh, with models, which will focus actually the network on one object at a time. 
which is really interesting. And also on one action at a time, if you draw, if you do synthesis and you want to draw objects. Other people said, okay, if we can describe an image uh, with words, why not asking questions actually? So the input of the system here is first an image and then a question on an image, like what are sitting in the basket on a bicycle? Right, so you see that there are two layers of attention here in this model. Which the so first one will concentrate, so here, that's the first layer, it would concentrate on all the words. So if I see what is sitting in the basket on the bicycle, so I will see the bicycle, the basket, and what is in the basket. And for the second attention layer here, uh, the more interesting word will be highlighted. So here it will be what are sitting in the basket. Okay, so you don't see the basket itself because you don't care. You don't see the bicycle. You don't really care. But what is sitting in this basket is the most important. And the answer is dogs. And here is a third, a third um, branch, blue branch, uh, in in our tree. Uh, of course, people in this community, in these three branches, know themselves. People here know themselves, but still, people from here and here do don't really know themselves. Then some people try to see what happens into. Um, into the DNNs to get some saliency maps in there, uh, not necessarily for a given application, but for several applications actually. So you can see here the the, the, the paper on GradCam, which is very influential. Uh, GradCam can be um, used with any, I mean any, with several applications like image classification here, uh, image captioning, as we saw, or visual question answering, as we just saw before. So you can take all those applications here, and once you have the results, so for image classification, it will be like, uh, oh, there is a cat in the image. Image captioning, uh, it will say a cat lying on the ground. And for visual question answering, uh, the question will be, is there a cat? And the answer here is yes. So depending on the, the um, application, that one, that one, or that one, we can go back up here into the feature maps and get the weights, which are the most important in those feature maps, to be able to help us to have those results, like saying yes here, describing the image here, or finding the tiger cat here. Okay, and then you can sum all this and make a saliency map, which here is where is a tiger cat, so what, what makes you think that this is a tiger cat, and the saliency map is here, so the hot region are on the cat, so features from the cat were used by the system to say that there is a cat uh, in here. All right, so this was a, a, an important paper. Uh, now you have, of course, much more uh, models than GradCam. They are some are faster, uh, some are uh, implemented in any DNN framework, etc. So you can really choose several. Um, gradcam like uh, models. And you can see examples here. Uh, for example, for object detection, if the system detects a dog, features to detect the dog comes from here. That's a saliency map. Features to detect a cat comes from there, especially from there, which is good. There, there are also errors, of course. Uh, you have features coming from the dog which entered into account to choose that this is a cat. So, of course, it's not perfect. Uh, for uh, image questioning here, 
if I want to know that the house has a green roof or a roof, I will look to the roof. Uh, if I want to talk about sheep grazing in the fields, well, I will look to the sheep here. And here again, if I know that in this uh, in this image uh, there is a group of people flying kites on a beach, then I will see the kites and the beach. And a man is sitting at a table with a pizza, I will see the man and the pizza and all the rest of the table. And so here I added this new branch uh, here of uh, saliency maps in deep uh, learning models. Uh, this is another color because it's somehow not exactly the same than the, the other applications. It's something uh, which can use several applications. And uh, attention here actually will not help the model to be better, it will just explain how the model works. Uh, I put another color, however, people in here know people in here, while people in here and people in here do not know themselves uh, really well. And finally, finally here, uh, an attempt to uh, make communication between those two communities that I showed in visual attention. Um, so DAS uh, in 2017, I think, um, made an experiment with uh, visual question answering. Okay, like here, what is covering the windows? Uh, he made eye tracking with real people, and so that's where people look before answering that there are blinds uh, covering the windows. He used several models, so mainly two models of uh, VQA, uh, that one of Young et al. and that one of Lou et al. Uh, in here. And they, he also used a bottom-up model from 2008, I think, which is Jude model. Uh, so that one is really based on bottom-up features. And so the question is, if I ask this question, uh, what is closer to where human look? Um, the saliency map of the VQA models or a simple feature-based bottom-up model? And actually the answer is quite interesting because if you don't uh, avoid a center BS, actually a very simple bottom-up model here will be much better actually and the model of 2008 will be much better than uh, VQA saliency of very modern models much closer actually to where humans look uh, and that's that's really interesting so actually one of the two models I think the the co-attention that one is is better than that one if we avoid um, the center bias uh, but I mean, this model is really not the best, uh, the best visual attention model that you can you can get. Uh, but it's it's really a very interesting work uh, trying to build a bridge between biological human attention and uh, attention modules within uh, neural networks. So finally, we add this last branch here in our attention tree, where people try to connect uh, visual attention from the community here, which tries to stick to biological visual attention, and the community here, which only uses an idea of what attention should be uh, within neural networks. And I think that's really very interesting because it could be good to better understand the relationship between biological attention, as it's done in here, and uh, DNNs, where attention is just a kind of module that you add, uh, because you know it's good to be added, but you don't really know exactly how it should act comparing to uh, where real people really look. 
And this brings me to the conclusion, my first conclusion, which is actually that, uh, well, at the beginning, everything was easy during 15 years. Uh, it was a linear research field and from 2015 you see that there are a lot of new branches coming out and using attention algorithm and actually this part of the people and this part of the people do not really know themselves well and this leads me to say that uh, I think it is really important to to do more transdisciplinary disciplinary work in here. Okay, so this this work was really interesting, uh, but we see that it was done by someone coming from this community um, because the models used from here are uh, not necessarily the best uh, models which could have been chosen. So I think that really there is a lot of work in trying to connect these two these two visions uh, of attention and the final conclusion is that visual attention is really interesting into uh, trying to explain what happens in a neural network uh, because if you know which are the features the network is focusing on or which uh, are the features which were chosen to take a decision, then you know why this decision were taken uh, and how you could change your network to change uh, the final decision. And this is very important because explicability is key for, for industry application. If you don't know what happens in your algorithm, you cannot make a certification of your algorithm. And if you don't have a certification of your algorithm, you cannot use it uh, in real life. Okay, so you can have a an intelligent car which makes 20 times the tour of the, the United States but if you cannot really explain what happens in its algorithm and it cannot be certified and you cannot sell it so this is really uh, expl explicability is really a key uh, in artificial intelligence in general and uh, I really think that visual attention can play a, a key role in, in, in that well, thank you very much for your attention, uh, the visual and auditive attention. Um, so here are some references that I used in this presentation, uh, which are grouped by uh, domain. So here you have the bottom-up models, um, the DNN-based models, deep features-based models, attention within DNN uh, with image captioning, uh, multi-object recognition, visual questioning and answering, um, DNN saliency maps and the study of uh, human uh, visual attention versus DNN visual attention here. So you can you can go deeper in each of these domains by uh, by using some of those uh, references uh, because of course my presentation was quite general so uh, I, I didn't really provide uh, very much details on each of those uh, approaches but by using those references you can easily uh, uh, get much deeper in, in those domains. Thank you again!